Hello there, thrill seekers. That's what I call you. Uh, before I start, remember blog, new stuff. I put a new article on my blog, hardcorezen.info, on Friday, and uh, you can go read that. I'm putting new stuff about every week. And I put a new thing on my podcast, which is the Hardcore Zen podcast. I do that about every week. Uh, please go and check those out. I really appreciate you checking them out. Okay, so today I got a question. And since before your sun burned hot in the sky and before your race was born, I have awaited a question. Here's the question. What does Zen say about chronic or terminal physical suffering from disabilities? I've yet to find anything on this subject in my own readings. I would say there's not a lot. Zicky's barking like crazy. I went over twice to see what he's barking at. I can't find a darn thing over there that's worth barking at, but... Ziggy, what are you barking at? Now he's coming to tell me that he's barking at this thing, but I don't know what it is. Anyway, so he must be suffering from some kind of pain. The pain of being a dog, I suppose, which is probably not that easy. Oh, he's barking at my father-in-law. Okay. That's what he always barks at. Okay, anyhow, uh, chronic physical pain from disabilities. Yes, you won't find a whole lot about that in classical Buddhist literature. I suppose if you dig around, you might find something in modern Buddhist literature. The only thing I know of off the top of my head is a book called Lotus in the Fire, which I actually last time I went looking for it, I couldn't find it, but it was about a Zen practitioner's uh, experience of, of uh, cancer, which, uh, which, spoiler alert, he survives at the end of the book, although I don't know uh, what happened after the book was written because it was published sometime in the 90s, but it's a pretty harrowing account of how he dealt with pain and how his Zen practice worked into that. And even though I would never read the book again because it was so intense, uh, I think it was great that I did read it because it, it, it uh, it's had a lot to say about how to deal with really, really intense, uh, constant pain. But if you want to talk about classical Zen literature, well, the first thing you got to remember is that the first noble pre noble truth, sorry, not, not noble precept, is that all life is suffering. So there is a lot in Zen literature about suffering. And I would suppose, reading back into the mindset of the people of the times that Buddhism first started going and Zen, you know, sect of Buddhism first started getting going, uh, probably chronic physical pain from a disability would just be, you know, for them just lumped under the category of general suffering because probably so many people suffered from what we would call chronic, chronic physical pain from disability uh, that it would hardly even merit a special mention being made of it because, well, all right, think about, think about your grandpa. Think about your grandpa when you tell your grandpa something that bugs you these days and he goes ah oh, back in my day we didn't have no discombobulated internet protocol random access generation murders and we didn't have none of that and we was happy about it okay so that's your grandpa and your grandpa is well my grandpa's not still alive neither of them but maybe your grandpa's even still alive and certainly he was alive during my lifetime so that means it's not that long ago so let's just go back to your grandpa's grandpa, and your grandpa's grandpa's grandpa, and your grandpa's 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 grandpa, and then we're getting back into the the mindset. So if your grandpa is telling you that the suffering that you're complaining about is trivial, imagine what your grandpa's 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 grandpa's, you know, whoever, however many generations back, would say if you went up to him and complained about the problems you have today. He'd probably go, oh my god, you're telling me that's a problem? You know, this, this, this literature comes from a time when there was no such thing as aspirin. There was no such thing as mosquito repellent or air conditioners or uh, combustion engines, you know? Sorry, Ziggy just got a treat. I don't know if my father-in-law gave it to him or what, but he's running, he's running around with this treat in his mouth. Anyway, so, uh, you know, if, if just going to the equivalent of, uh, of, you know, five blocks away or, or a mile away, let's say, or 
two kilometers away if you're metric uh, involved walking or, or sitting on a horse for that time you know the, the kind of pain that we complain about is nothing which I'm not trying to minimize people who are suffering from chronic pain due, dis, due to disabilities because that's serious stuff but and generally, you know, I, I think that falls under the, the rubric of pain. So what do you do about that kind of pain when pain is a constant thing? So for what I'm trying to say is that the pain that we suffer and that we think of as extraordinary was, was probably, you know, chronic. You know, just this, this is just what happens all the time wherever you are uh, in the world of, of somebody like Dogen. And in fact, I was looking up Dogen's extensive record today because Shobo Genzo, he stopped writing maybe about 10 years before he died, but he was still writing some of this stuff in this book up until maybe two years before he died, or maybe even a few of the things during the year that he died. And he died at age 54, which, okay, a lot of people go, oh, well, everybody died that age when it was 800 years ago. That's not really the case. Uh, the actual fact is a, a, a person could expect, not expect, but a person could easily live into his 80s or 90s, his or her 80s or 90s, even 800 years ago. It was just that more people statistically got killed you know, got killed by something, disease or, or just general malnutrition or whatever, you know, wars and, and all sorts of stuff uh, back in those days. So it brought the general, you know, uh, median age of life expectancy way down. So when you say that Dogen died when he was 54 or 53, depending on how you count the age, because there's a different way. Of, in in uh, Asia, they traditionally would count you as being one year old when you're born. Uh, they don't do that so much anymore, at least in Japan, but uh, but that's the common thing. Uh, so so Dogen died when he was 54 by his reckoning, 53 by our reckoning. That was unusual. So there and and there's no uh, record of him being assassinated or killed in a war. So he must have had some kind of disease. In fact, there is some writings by his disciples about his illness, although they don't say much. Uh, we know that he kept on running the temple uh, up until he died, and supposedly uh, he died sitting zazen. Now, a lot of the accounts of people who are Zen practitioners in the past will say they died sitting zazen. I tend to believe they probably did, but, you know, it, it's always good to try to make your teacher look good after he's dead. So saying that he died sitting zazen makes him look pretty good pretty cool. So, you know, you got to take that with a grain of salt. But I think it's probably true. And the reason I think it's probably true is because, as far as I know, my teacher Nishijima Roshi didn't die while doing Zazen, but he did Zazen in his hospital bed when he was dying. Now, people who were around him at the time have told me so. So, he was, I, I don't know what he uh, actually died from. I don't know what the, you know, the cause of death listed on his death certificate was, but he was 90 three years old, I think. Anyway, even when you're 93 years old and you're in the hospital, there's something wrong with you and some kind of disease is happening, but he practiced even with it. Uh, as far as Dogen is concerned, I tried to find something in this book in which he talks about his illness or, or his, his pain, and uh, I just couldn't find anything. I mean, it's a big book. It's got an index. That's the reason I sprung for, I, I have the hardback of this, and then I actually bought the paperback too, because the paperback has an index, I found out, after they published the hardback, then they republished it with an index. The hardback does not have an index, so don't buy the hardback. Anyway, going through the index and just leafing through at random to some of the later entries in his work, I don't find anything about his chronic pain, although I do find this, which I, I thought was kind of interesting. In this Dharma Hall discourse that he, Dogen, gave actually towards what ended up being the end of Dogen's life, uh, he gives a, he, he gives the death poem, the final poem written by one of his students named Sokai. And it turns out that Sokai's years of life are 1216 to 1242, which means that he was 26 or 27 years old when he died, and he says 27. So here's his death poem. In 27 years, 
my ancient debt is not repaid. Leaping over the empty sky, I shoot myself into hell like an arrow. That's his death poem. And after reciting this, the teacher Dogen said, last night Sokai, uh, whose name means Sangha Ocean, dried up. So that's why he says Sokai dried up. How profusely the cloud and water monks, those are the, the just monk, cloud and water monks means uh, monks, have been crying. Although I see you, Sokai, down to the ocean bottom, tears fill my breast like an overflowing lake. Yesterday I held up and shook the whisk for your spirit. With this one word upon your departure, I don't wait for you to revive. So that's how Dogen dealt with this guy uh, who died, and it looks like he may have been one of his Dharma heirs. Dharma transmission from Dogen after Ajo. So yeah, it, it says that he was one of uh, Dogen's Dharma heirs, so he must have been very close uh, to this person. Uh, and he died when he was 27 years old, and he had time to compose a poem before he died. So we can imagine that it must have been something. You know, uh, stuff went around all the time that just killed lots and lots of people, and nobody knew what the heck it was. That was just a normal facet of life 800 years ago in rural Japan. So, um, you know, I'm just putting that out there for you to, to think about. And now here's a couple of things I found from Kobenchino Roshi, who was uh, my teacher's teacher. I don't know if uh, I found these in a PDF, which has a different title from Embracing Mind, so I'm not sure exactly. I think all this stuff is in Embracing Mind, which is the book I'm holding up, uh, but it might not be. But here is some of Koben, my teacher's teacher's talks about pain. You can feel pain, but you cannot have it. It is not yours. For some, the whole universe is aching. It's all a matter of degrees. And I tell you, when I've been in some serious pain myself, it did feel like the entire universe was aching. It happens, so let it go. Blow the pain away with your breath. It sounds easy, but Coben saying this knows it's not easy. We have come together as this condensed form, so in this situation just sit upright and align yourself with gravity. He's describing what it is to be a human being. There is another pain that shows up as soon as you practice and it has nothing to do with your legs. This pain is a feeling of something missing, like forgetting an important item while holding so many packages, like searching for a lost child, or an urge to be with someone. It is the separation from something that you are meant to be, that is nearby. Removed from it, you feel the pull toward it. So there is practice, student, teacher, father, daughter, so on. How to sustain the relationship with space between, connected but not too entangled and able to move, that is the issue. And here's Coben in a passage that is just titled, All Beings Are Nothing But Pain. This living human being, human body, contains burning energy. This must be the reason we experience pain. When you touch a hot thing, you say, ouch. When a burning flame comes close, you say, oh, it hurts. When your life is facing the same kind of intensity, that must be what causes pain. Buddha's first sermon was, all beings are nothing but pain. He is saying life itself is pain. He is not looking down from a high, peaceful place at the suffering people below. Many of his fellow practicers were old friends, whom he encouraged to look into the reasons for each painful experience. And now here is one of my favorites. We sometimes complain of pain in the legs, neck, or back, but know that pain is always there. You've just noticed it. It's not something you newly produced. Sometimes it shows up in other activities, such as when you walk up steep hills. When you stop climbing a mountain, the pain goes away, but you know the pain is still there. Although we call it pain, it is simply a force which came along with our existence. Maybe in this force there is always pain, if there is sense to feel it. When I touch my stick, my nyoi, this is a stick he carries, uh, every Zen teacher carries, to the floor, both my stick and the floor feel pain, but they don't say so. When a new life is born, the intensity of that force lets the mother feel pain along with incredible joy, which is another part of the pain. If you just see the good or pleasant part of an activity and avoid the pain, or avoid piercing cold or suffocating heat, then you are limiting yourself, not letting the force go from one end to the other. 
So those are some things. Now, just circling back to chronic physical pain of disabilities, in in just real life situations, what I've the only thing I've ever been able to do with that is if somebody comes to me who has a specific chronic physical pain and they want to do zazen, then I'll talk to that person one on one on on how we're going to deal with that. Uh, and usually something can be worked out. One of my best stories sort of makes me tear up a little bit was a guy I never met him but he used to write to me and I think he had MS multiple sclerosis and he was trying to deal with sitting zazen and we exchanged emails for a while on how he could do zazen and finally I think I ended up I don't know if he suggested this or I suggested it but he did zazen by putting a, a wooden plank on the floor that was big enough to contain his body and laying flat on the wooden plank, you know, in his in as close as he could get to a Zazen posture. And that's how he did it, because that's he didn't I don't think he had enough core strength to hold himself up sitting anymore. So that's what he did. This was a person who really wanted to practice and years after that email exchange, after I'd forgotten it, this person, a young person, showed up at one of my talks when we were in Santa Monica still. And after I, you know, after we'd done the zazen and stuff, he came up to me and said, that was my dad, and I came here because my dad had told me how helpful you had been uh, to him in the last days of his life, and he's passed away now, and, uh, and this guy wanted to meet me. Never saw him again, <laughs> but I don't think he lived in, uh, uh, nearby, so uh, I think that's why I never saw him again. But so there is a way to do it for anybody, but you know, that way may have to include a lot of specific modifications. And to say in a kind of a general way how to deal with that sort of thing, it's just impossible. You have to know what the specific thing is. Uh, and I think it's better to kind of give the sort of one-size-fits-all, which doesn't fit all, practice uh, to everybody and then let other people, individuals, figure out how to sort that out for themselves, how that works. Okay, there we go. I've gone on long enough about pain, I think, and now Ziggy's back to barking again, so maybe I should go look at what he's doing. So anyway, if you want to help ease my pain, my hunger pains, uh, you can send a donation to me via PayPal and Patreon if you go to the links that are appearing on your screen, which is hardcorezen.info slash donate. That is hardcorezen.info slash donate. I'm trying to guess where the terop, where the superimposed thing will be. Anyway, that helps me out a lot. I appreciate that. I am supported almost entirely by your donations, but I offer this for free, so if you don't want to donate, you don't have to donate, so don't worry about it. Just I'm thanking those of you who do donate and uh, saying where to donate if you want to become one of those if you aren't one already. Uh, so I do appreciate that, but it's not necessary. Anyway, we will see you next time. Have a good time all the time. Bye. What you barking at, buddy? Are you okay? All right. We'll talk to you later. Stop barking so much. <laughs>